you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. The message that God has been laying on my heart for you all today is entitled, Facing Challenges with Strong Faith. Amen. We're getting to a place that we're going to have to live by faith. Jesus said in Luke 18, When I return to earth, will I find faith? That's sobering. When I return to earth, Jesus said, will I find faith? What some people call faith is really not faith. It's just a hope. God wants you to have faith. Faith gives you some abilities that in the natural you don't have. And if you don't have these abilities that faith gives you, faith to see beyond your circumstances, faith to believe beyond your circumstances, faith to break the status quo, because the enemy is wanting to conform and push us into the image of man. He's a liar. We've got to have faith. Otherwise, when challenges come, we'll cave under the pressure. You don't wake up one morning and say, well, I'm going to go take on Goliath. You've got to go through some things. You've got to walk with God. The Bible says those who know God shall be strong and do great exploits. The only way you're going to get to know God is walk with Him. And when you walk with Him, He shows Himself strong on your behalf. Look at Romans 8, 28. Let's dig into this. Hear what the Spirit's got to say to us. And we know that all things. How many things? That means everything will work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. There's conditions to that promise, y'all. You're called to a purpose. He formed you in your mother's room for a purpose. For whom He foreknew. He knew you before your mom and daddy knew you. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed, limited in advance to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God is for you, is God for you? See, now we say that, but do we really know that? We don't always know that. God, are you for me? Verse 36. As it is written, Lord, for your sake we are killed all day long. And we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling, doesn't it? We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet yeah, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I am persuaded... That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able, none of these things shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As a follower of Christ, let me ask you this question. Are you not finding it more and more difficult to stand for your faith in this present world? It's becoming more and more difficult, is it not? The vitriol, the hatred that the world is showing against true Christians that show their true faith. I understand what it means to do wrong and to be punished for wrong behavior. Do you understand that? You do wrong, you get whooped. But how do you explain doing what is right according to God's word and being punished for that? See, that messes with our minds because I did right. I did what God said for me to do, but I'm getting punished for what I'm doing. That messes with you, does it not? It can shake your faith. So to the Spirit and of the Spirit, you'll reap life and peace. That's what the Bible says. So to the Spirit, and it gets you on the 6 o'clock news sometimes because it stirs up demons, y'all. If we don't understand why we are punished by the world for doing God's will, it can and will cause us to develop an inferiority complex. 
We can begin as the world comes against us for standing up for our faith and for speaking the truth into people's lives. We can develop a negative view of ourselves because of their rejection, because of their hatred, because of their dismissiveness of us. And then begin to experience all kinds of negative feelings about ourselves. You know, you and I, we do well walking on the water. As long as we keep our eyes on Jesus. But the moment doubt enters our heart, we start taking on and ingesting what we were walking on top of. Once doubt gets inside of your heart, you'll start getting confused. You'll get disoriented. You'll start losing your balance spiritually. You won't have the confidence that you had. And it'll feel like you're drowning. That's why that story is in Mark where Peter says, bid me come. And Jesus said, come. And he started going out on the water, walking on that water. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, that storm cannot uphold you. Only looking at Jesus can uphold you to walk on what otherwise you would drown in. And as he began to sink, he's a professional fisherman, y'all. He was drowning because it was a spiritual moment. And when we let people, because we're doing what's right, we're doing what pleases God, but they reject us, they ostracize us, and because of that, we will, if we start listening to it, because it is a mantra of the world to hate Christians, and it's a continuous drumbeat, and we're getting that day in and day out. We don't like you. We don't want to hear what you have to say. Shut up and sit down. And they keep beating that drum. And eventually we'll start listening to that drum and falling in line with that. And doubt starts pulling inside of us. And if we do, we become unstable in all our ways. And then we'll begin to experience as a result all types of negative feelings about ourselves. And this is where we get into dangerous waters. And all we've done is attempt to live openly for Christ. You can be a closet Christian, the world won't mind. You start living openly, they mind. Another trap that Satan wants Christians to get ensnared in because of the way this world mistreats and hates us is the trap of being a victim. I prayed, Lord, when... He gave me this, what I'm about to say, that people would not take offense to it, that they would hear what the Spirit is saying. This is a trap of the enemy. He wants us because we're doing what God said, and the world hates us, rejects us, and tries to force us into bending and bowing into their shape. It can cause us to fall into the trap of being a victim. Unfortunately, this generation has fallen prey to the deceptive power of becoming a victim of society. Am I preaching yet? For a Christian, listen, for Christians to take on a victim mindset because of the way the world and sinners are treating us and rejects us and mistreats us is to say that God isn't with us to deliver us. What did the man at the pool of Bethesda say when Jesus says, do you want to be healed? He says, I have no man to help me in the pool. That's the problem with Christians in America. We want a man to help us. Come on. I'm coming against this spirit that's coming against y'all seven days a week. I'm through the power of Christ exposing that dark, evil spirit that says I have no man to help me out. The devil is a liar. You don't need a man to help you out when Jesus is standing right there in front of you and says, do you want to be made whole? I don't know. I need to go consult my physician. We'll go and consult them. But while you're doing it, pray in the Spirit on the way. Because a lot of physicians right now are motivated out of money and fear. The woman with the issue of blood spent all that she had and was none the better but was worse. And she says, if I can but touch. Well, if I develop a mindset of victimization because I did what God said and the world hated me, they rejected me. Remember this, it was the world that rejected you. It was not God. 
God is with you and that God is for you. Even Paul said it in Scripture. If God be for us, who can be against us? They're going to be against us, but the weapons that are formed against us who stand in faith will not be able to prosper. Psalm 46 says, Our God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He's right there with you. Just because you got trouble show up on that day don't mean God took a vacation. He's right there with you, but your emotions go off the map. Your thoughts start running all over the place because trouble has met up with you. He's right there. He was there with you when you were having fun. He's there with you when you're going through hell. He's a very present help. Sooner we get this revelation, he's always with us, even in the tough times. The quicker we can get through these birthing pains. Just because we are hated as followers of Christ, many that are watching today, you know what it's like to be hated because you're a follower of Christ. It doesn't mean that God has abandoned us. Being rejected by the world should be a clear indicator to us that God has accepted us. I like that. The world hates me. Good. Blessed are you when you're persecuted and reviled of men for my name's sake. It means I've accepted you. You're accepted in the beloved. I have adopted you. I put my name on you. I put my blood in you. I have bought you back and you belong to me, God says. You are not abandoned. We are not orphans in this world. We have a father, and his name is God. We are not orphans. We are not beggars. We're children of the king of glory. Come on, somebody. Help me preach this today. We are not going to beg. We're not going to plead. We're going to ask God in faith. Now, Paul teaches that even though we may experience more in our fair share of afflictions and troubles in this life, nothing, say it, nothing shall be able to separate us from God's love. It's not going to happen. There is absolutely nothing Satan or the world or demons can do to separate us from God's love. It ain't going to happen. So if none of this can separate us from God's love, why do we feel alone when we are hated? It's a test of our faith. You're not as sure when you're in the oven as you were when you were on the golf course. Yes, God's for me. Praise God. Look at all I have. And then you go into the furnace of affliction. Where are you, God? I'm right there with you. If it wasn't for me, you couldn't stand up as it is. Numbers 13. Something has happened to me because I used to preach. I don't just preach. I preach feel this it's like it's taking me over numbers 13 30 they've sent the spies in to spy out the land 12 tribes of israel each have sent a spy in there come back 10 of them give an evil report to them give god's report get down to verse 30 then caleb quieted the people before moses and said see it was the unbelieving lying spies that worked up the people Unbelief and lies work up frenzies. Yes. 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 The world is the one that works us up. It's not us. We're trying to get everybody to chill, calm down before you hurt yourself. And the world's working it up. So Caleb comes and quiets the people before Moses and said, Let us go up when? Not tomorrow, not next week. Let us have a planning committee. He said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. If I were to come in here today and tell y'all, guys, America is ripe for the taking. Let us go up at once and take possession of America, for we are well able to overcome it. How many of y'all would step out and go and take this land back for God? Enough babies have died in the world. Enough is enough. When are we going to get fed up with the status quo? But the men, oh, glory, the men, those men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against this people, 
for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad or evil report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. Really? Why were there people still there? See, that's the gift of exaggeration. That's what fear does. It exaggerates the problem and makes it bigger than it really is. And all the people, all of them, y'all, even the little three-year-olds that we saw were men of great stature. And there we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Hmm. Now I want you to notice the mindset and the perception that these men developed all because they refused to walk and to live by faith. When you don't walk and live by faith, you will develop mindsets and perceptions like victimization. Fear of man. Their enemies saw them as grasshoppers. That's perception. Were they grasshoppers? No. And the men agreed with their enemies. We were grasshoppers in our own sight. That's agreeing with your enemies. We as the church got to stop agreeing with what the world is saying about us. They don't know us because we're not from here. When we don't choose to exercise our faith during adversity like we're in right now, we will inevitably align our thoughts processes with the enemy and begin to agree with the enemy's will for our lives like these spies did and ultimately the children of Israel did instead of agreeing with God's will. Wow. I want to ask this question of those ten spies. I'd like to have their ear for just a few minutes. That went in there and spied out the land and brought back an evil report that the inhabitants of the land saw them as grasshoppers. What? Did you guys go in there and take a poll of the giants? Did you ask them, what do you think of us? Where did they get that assessment? They conferred with them. And they belittled themselves because they were not walking by. When you walk in the presence of giants, you're going to feel intimidated because you're walking in the flesh. But if you're walking in there like David, they bred for us, boys. God gave me a, an insight on giant. Let me break it down for you. It's not one syllable, it's two. It's giant. Grasshoppers are bigger than giants. And in God's sights, giants are giants. It's not by bite. It's not by power. It's by a spirit. It's one thing to say that we're children of God and that we're people of faith. But at some point, at some point, I don't know what that point is, but at some point, if we don't stand on the promises of God in faith, we will not you got to stand on the promises. And here's why. Here's the problem we fall into when we become apathetic, lazy in our faith. Well, I don't need my faith today. I'll put it in my back pocket. And I'll use it like a get-out-of-jail card when I really need it. If you don't stand on the faith every day and on the promises of God, then you won't have the faith to fight off what our enemy is trying to project on us as being weak. And that's exactly what's going on in the body of Christ. We're conforming. We're bending. We're bowing. We're abdicating, giving over our authority to the enemy and to this world because we are not daily walking by faith and exercising our faith. David didn't just get out there on the battlefield and say, I'm going to take down that giant. He had a track record with God. He'd been walking. I mean, the man wrote Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. How do you know that? He's been walking with me in the wilderness. My father and them, they rejected me. I found Lord was there with me. He never forsook me. Because he walked with God. And all the men in Israel's army did not. Only he had the authority. Only he had the strength to stand. Can you imagine coming out there on the field? You little ruddy boy with a sack launch, not being militarily trained, and you say, I'll take him on. 
Can you put yourself in that mindset, in that place? What have I done? I'm telling you the truth. Me and my big mouth. No. He had faith. True faith will follow through to victory. It won't matter who says you can't do this. Come on, let me put my armor on you. Did you know while they tried to put armor on him, it wasn't about defense? Say, that's man. We got to defend ourselves against the enemy. What did God tell him to do? Go get five smooth stones. What's that? Offense. If you're in defense, you're in the flesh. We already... I ain't even going to say it. First Peter 4, verse 12. Now we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty where we live. Beloved, that's y'all. Y'all are beloved. Do not think it's strange. Strange, strange. <laughs> Don't think it's strange, y'all. First thing you'll do is think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. So fiery trials do what? They try us. But it's not us. It's the faith in us. It's the Christ in us. Don't get those mixed up. Because if you think this trial's to try you, you're already lost. As though some strange thing. Isn't it interesting that he used strange twice? If these things are strange to you, you need to introduce yourself to the spirit realm. As though something strange happened to you. Have you noticed Christians are the only ones that go through hell? Go to the job with a bunch of sinners. Tell them what you're going through. I thought you were saved. Why are you having all those problems? Me and my family got it going on. Am I not speaking the truth? You're going through all kinds of torment. They over there living for Satan, shacking up, doing all kinds of things. And they're just being like they're blessed, but they're not blessed. God's given them grace to repent. And they're sending away their day of grace. But then you go and tell them, I'm going through this. Well, why don't you call yourself a Christian? Because one day I'm going to leave this world and I don't want to go to hell. But rejoice, y'all, to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. We are called to suffer as Christ suffered. So instead of thinking it's strange because all these bad things are happening to us, start rejoicing. That'll mess with the sinners. Hallelujah, I got a bad diagnosis. Well, why are you shouting? Because I know God is my physician, and through him, God is going to get the glory over this diagnosis. When I walk in here and tell you the doctor's scratching their head, they run tests, they can't find anything. Now I know it was on the x-ray. I know they proved it, but now they're saying our x-ray machine lied. No, the devil is a liar. God showed up, and y'all don't want to admit it. But rejoice to the extent you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached, disdained, hated for the name of Christ, blessed are you. Don't try to fit in. Don't try to be friends with the world. Be God to the world. And the spirit of glory... And of God rest upon you. See, that's on you, y'all. On their part, the world, he is blasphemed. But on our part, Christians, he is glorified. But while all this is going on, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a busybody, in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Now there's the problem. When we start suffering for Christ, there's shame associated with that because we've been naming one thing, declaring one thing, and it ain't happening. Abram, yes. No longer will your name be Abram, you'll be Abraham. You'll be a father of many nations. 25 years, he's not having a son. Huh, reproached. Confessing one thing and living another. That's not hypocrisy. That's speaking those things that be not as though they were. And you think, my God, I've been confessing this stuff for years, and it's not happening. What are you doing to me, God? God said, I'm going to see if you're going to suffer with me. 
Because you know, once you say something out your mouth in faith, they all over it. Like bees on honey, they're going to get all over you, get up in your business and say, now what was it you said about what God's going to do with you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They'd be talking out the other side of their mouth when you show up and you got the goods. Look at Isaac. Yeah, I was dead. But God. Read on. Don't stop there. Four. The time has come. That word has come, those words were added. For the time for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? That's why we want to obey the gospel. We want to be instant in season and out of season, whether they like us or not, whether they invite us to their clique or not. We're going to go with God, right? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved... When I return to earth, will I find faith? If we're righteous and we're scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? That's sobering scriptures. Peter gives us great counsel in these verses. We're not to consider it strange concerning the fiery trials that we go through. When we agree with God, we won't be able to agree with the world and those who live in their sins. We cannot agree with it. We cannot agree with what our government is doing now. Can we? You can't. And if you, listen, if you don't agree with the government, if you don't agree with the world, eventually, you know, the world is round. We'll get to it. Eventually, your disagreement with them will cause you to come face to face with them. And then you're going to have to stand. Now, did you really mean what you said? That you're Christian and all that? Because if you really mean that, then we're going to have war here. We're going to tear you down. We're going to tear your family down. We're going to fire you. We're going to put you in a pit because you're standing up against us and you don't agree with our philosophy and you don't agree with what we're doing here. So we're going to challenge you on your faith. When you face that, are you really ready to stand against that? Are you? Boy, getting quiet. Let me remind you, not all 12 got out of the boat. Since we can't agree or align ourselves with those who live, this is exactly what's going on right now in America. We cannot agree or align ourselves with those who live in sin and condone sinful behavior. Since we don't, they will view our rejection of their sin as rejection of them. And that's exactly what they do because they're one, synonymous with their sin. So if you reject their sin, you're rejecting them. But we're not rejecting them. But because they think we're rejecting them because we've rejected their sin, it's not us that is rejecting them. It's the Word of God. We're walking in covenant with God, and we're keeping His covenant, and whatever He calls sin is sin. I'm just repeating what I heard, read. Now, because we reject their sin, they will reject us. See, they don't fight fair, the world doesn't. It's a double standard with the world. We reject their sin, but they reject us. If we rejected them, that's discrimination. We call that racism. And then they turn on us. They wanted to be our friends, but now they found out you're going to stand up against what they say is right. Boy, those claws will come out, and they will turn into a demon right in front of your face. It's like, was that there all along? Yes, it was. I think Jesus called them vipers. Those of our own household, Matthew 10 says, will turn on us when we stand up for the truth. However, if believers who aren't exercising their faith get caught up into the crosshairs of someone's disdain or hatred of them because they claim to be a Christian, since they're not truly exercising their faith and believe that God is with them, they will begin to take on the responsibility of the problem. And here's where we're at. We're taking on the responsibility of the problem because we're not really exercising our faith. And we'll fight in the weaknesses of our flesh. This is why so many believers, quote, unquote, believers, use that term loosely, are acting just like the world and are copying bad attitudes because they're taking on the spirit of the world by not rising above their enemies in faith and turning to God to deliver them. They have no hope. 
What did the children of Israel do every time there was a problem? They wanted to revert back. People who say they have faith but do not truly exercise their faith, they will revert back in a time of crisis. And it will be as if they're not even saved. Fear will take them over. It's time for the true Christians. I've told you this for a while. God has drawn a line in the sand. And he's going to divide the sheep from the goats. The true from the hypocrites. Let me put this another way. The true Christian from the apostate Christian. They were with us. They were numbered among us. But they went out from us. It's time for us as Christians to begin to accept who we are in Christ. And take our faith seriously. We're there. You better take your faith dead seriously right now. So that you won't give in to the pressures of persecution and become like those who reject you. It'll happen. They'll flip on you on a dime if they're not in faith. Let me, I'll share something with you. I wasn't going to share this, but I feel like it'll fit right here. You have to be careful how you share your faith. I'm not talking about with the world. I'm talking about with people who say they have faith. You really do. Because if you're not careful, they'll talk you out of your Isaac. Well, I'm believing God for a miracle. You better go to the doctor then. No, I'm standing in faith. You're an idiot. And they say they're Christians and they love you. You know what happens whenever your faith excels their faith? Their care for you will turn in control of you. And they will want to dominate you because they're exercising their fear. Fear will control the devil is a liar. I break this in the name of Jesus. You've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is not a denominational church. You don't fall in line with Asa Doctrine. You better fall in line with the Word of God and get your faith right with God. You're not going to blame me for why you turned on God. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So don't be shocked. When you tell them you're standing by faith and they turn on you and start trying to control what you believe in God for because they acting in fear at that moment. You just rebuke them and move on. It's coming. Remember over in Nazi Germany? Their neighbors turned neighbors in because their neighbors weren't conforming to the dictates of Germany. It's happening again. And it's going to happen within the people of faith because they will fear man more than they fear God and because of that fear they will fear for their lives and they'll turn you in they'll turn on you in other words we ain't got there yet stay tuned God opposes the proud James 4 says right I said God opposes the proud but what does he do to the humble he gives us grace grace is his ability his power his strength to overcome what in the flesh we cannot do. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If the ten lying spies had humbled themselves to do God's will and to heed to the promises that he spoke through Moses to them, they would have come back from spying out the land with a victorious report just like Caleb. If they believed like Joshua and Caleb, they would have come back like Joshua and Caleb. Your faith or the lack thereof, will affect your perception of yourself and your circumstances. Y'all need to get that. Your faith, or the lack thereof, will affect your perception of yourself and your situations. I'm defeated. I'm going down. I'm going under. No faith. We will overcome this land. We will overcome every giant in this land. Not because I said so, but because God says, I have given you the land wherever your feet have already trod. If we hear, we own it. See, the reason why we're not more excited is because they're not at the door with guns saying we're taking your land. If they were at the door with guns saying we're going to take your land, we'd get a little more excited about we able to take the land. Right? I'm telling you, this is a word from God. This is not fear-mongering. Yeah. 
Peter stated in these verses that judgment must begin at the house of God. Let me break that down for you because that wants to put fear in people. That simply means that God will render a decision. That's what judges do. I'm going to go. I'm going to look at all the evidence and all the testimonies. I'm going to go and I'm going to consider what I've heard. I'm going to come back. I'm going to render a judgment. Yes or no? For or against? God says it's time for his judgment to begin to the house of God. That all, all that means is he's going to judge either for us or against us. And he'll give grace to the humble and he will oppose the proud. So those who are hearers and not doers, where do you think they're going to fall when judgment comes? And God renders a decision. They wouldn't humble themselves. They wouldn't do what God told them to do. And God gave them space. And God says, I'm against you. Didn't he tell Israel, you will die in the wilderness because you would not do what I told you to do. God's going to render a decision about his people when he chooses to judge his house. As the pressures of persecution rise in the nations of the world, and it is, God wants to know who is living by faith and who is only claiming to have faith. Whoa. The furnace of afflictions will reveal who is and who is not walking and living by faith. Now, when you truly walk by faith and allow God to reveal who you are in the Spirit to you, you won't accept the identity that the world is projecting upon you. They can call you a racist, a hater, an elitist. They could call you too white or too black or too yellow or too brown. They project that stuff on us. It's not true. It's what's in them. It's like that projector up there. It projects what's in it. God wants to know who is living by faith. Are you living by faith? When you truly walk by faith and allow God to reveal who you are, you won't accept the identity of the world. They're trying to stamp their identity on us. And we cannot accept this anymore, can we? So they will shame and persecute us because we will not accept it. That's what's next. We're giving you opportunity right now. Right now. In America, we're being given an opportunity. Are you going to accept what we're handing down? Then the next step will be, if you don't accept what we're handing down, we're going to force you into it. I want you to imagine, if you will, you go into a hospital. You're going to get a procedure. And a physician walks in and says, uh, Sir, Madam, before we do this procedure, we want to talk about your immune system. Now, if you don't take care of these things that you haven't done, we won't treat you. Not in America. That would never happen in America, would it? Would it? It's happening right now. We want somebody healthy. If you reject this, you're rejecting our health. Well, excuse me, but God gave me a mind, and he gave me an immune system, and he gave me faith. Now, in America, we have the thing called the freedom of religion. I don't know if y'all heard about it in this hospital. As for me and my house, we're going to serve God. But what are you going to do when the rubber hits the road? Are you going to cave? No, we're not going to cave. We're going to go to the altar. Like he prophesied, we're going to get the horns of the altar and say, God, they're forming gallows down here. They're forming traps for us. What do you want us to do? Acts 2.22. I'm giving you scripture. There will be a test. This is the hope right here. Acts 2.22. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit has come. They're in the upper room. They're all speaking in tongues as the Spirit has given utterance to them. And they're all speaking the gospel in every man's native tongue that's there. There were Jews from all the nations had gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. But what they didn't realize, the Feast of Pentecost was also going to be fulfilled because God was going to pour out His Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now, mind you, Jesus, when this time has come, He has come back from the dead... 
And he's been walking the streets of Jerusalem, healing the sick, preaching the gospel for 40 days. Wow. And everybody's seen it. That's what cracks me up about his 40 days after. Did you know he started his ministry with 40 days fast and praying, and he ended his earthly ministry with 40 days of ministering? See, what you sow in one time, God's going to let you reap in another time. So don't faint when you sow him because you will reap if you'll go through the 40 days and nobody messes with him. You know why? These Egyptians whom you see today, you'll see again no more. When you overcome the enemy and you come back, they can't even touch you. A dog can't even wag his tail against you because God says you already defeated them. They can't move to touch you. And Jesus walked through the streets freely doing everything that he had done before he was crucified. And then, 10 days after he's ascended is 50 days. They're in the upper room and they're praying. And the Holy Spirit is poured out. And they all start speaking in tongues. Now, not everybody out there that heard what was going on, heard the gospel. Some of them, they heard something else. And it irritated them what they were hearing. Verse 22, are you there? This is interesting. Men of Israel, now, let me set this up. They come, these people that didn't hear the gospel but heard babbling tongues, they said, these guys are drunk on wine, and it's just the middle of the day. These people have an issue. They're projecting. Right? They're projecting. They don't know what's going on. And we pay them credence. We give them a microphone. These guys are drunk. They're the ones that are clueless, so why do we listen to them? Those guys get paid seven figures to tell you bad news. Why do we listen to them? They don't know what's going on. They don't care what's going on as long as they get their check. They literally did this. They taped newscast across this nation out of different local and regional television stations that were secular. And they played the clips of the anchors giving the news verbatim. Every one of them said the exact same thing. Oh, I got to listen to the news. Break your neck to get to the news. They don't know what's going on. So they think they drunk. So let's pick it up, verse 22. I've got to get done. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. This is Peter speaking. A man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him. In your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands. Are you hearing what Peter is telling these men? He's not saying y'all are good guys. He's saying y'all are real bad. Y'all took an innocent man and did an evil thing against him and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Anytime there is a genuine move of God where souls are being saved from sin, there will always arise unbelievers to speak against God's power. And there will always be those unbelievers who will smear those whom God is using. They will smear their character. If they're broke, they'll smear them for being broke. If they're wealthy, they'll smear them for being wealthy. They'll find something to smear you on, so don't try to please them. The aim of the unbelievers, hear what the Spirit is saying, I'm almost done. The aim of unbelievers is to undermine and to discredit the move of God. Yes. Now, I told you recently that the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm giving you the formula for revival. The weight of glory was the first part of that. This is another part of that formula. Hear what the Spirit is saying. They will try to discredit the move of God and the servants of God, and here's why, so that the lost will turn a deaf ear to the gospel. That's why they attack us. That's why we're to live above reproach, but don't try to please man. Big difference. 
Did Peter sit back quietly and accept that the unbelieving Jews, what they were saying about the 120 who were in the upper room and were speaking the gospel in every man's native tongue as the Spirit gave them utterance, did he sit back and take it quietly? No. No. Who's going to take on this uncircumcised Philistine? David said, I'll do it. Who's going to take a stand? Esther. When Haman says, I'm going to annihilate your people. Have you noticed how many times in the Bible that Israel was on the brink of destruction and annihilation and one person was moved on to turn the thing around? You can preach something and preach something and preach something and finally somebody who's been hearing it will fall up under the pressure. Are you going to stand? And they will be singled out like the woman in Kentucky who would not bow to the dictates of the administration and says, I'm not going to do it. And she worked in government. She became a lightning rod. People hated her and didn't even know her. They smeared her. They put her on television, made her look like she was a hick. But she stood. And God exonerated her. If you'll stand, when they turn you apart limb from limb, if you will stand, God will arise and exonerate you. Did Peter back down? No. Peter went head to head and toe to toe with the doubting Jews, and then he preached the gospel in their face more intently so that those who were coming against the outpouring of God's Spirit he preached to the point that these men that were doubting what was going on and calling it of alcohol and not the Spirit, they became convicted in their hearts. We're too afraid in America to preach that kind of gospel. I'll lose everything if I do that. You already lost it. You lost your witness, you lost your faith, you lost your testimony, and you lost your respect with everybody. The naysayers couldn't stop or resist the man of God as he stood there in faith declaring the truth instead of hiding out in a room in fear, which is exactly what he did when Jesus died. But he didn't do it on the day of Pentecost. Uh-uh. He said, no, that old man dead. I went through a sifting. When Jesus says you're going to get sifted, you might as well just brace yourself. It's going to get rough, but the good thing going to come out of it. You won't bow. This cost me too much, y'all. There will come a time in believers' lives where we will have to. We will indeed be forced to stand for the truth like Peter did on this day. And this is only going to intensify the pressure between the forces of evil and righteousness. And that's where it gets very seriously. When the righteous say we're not going to bend, we're not going to concede, we're not going to give in, they will pull out everything that is in them against you and it will be a showdown but if you'll stand you gotta stand how long see we miss this in the story of David and Goliath whoever won that battle the nation of that winner will be served by the nation of the loser we talk about the lady in uh, Kentucky Different ones throughout history, like Dr. Martin Luther King and those that stood with him. We talk about them. What would have happened if they hadn't stood? What well, if they kept quiet? What well, if they said, no, it's going to be too high a price? Bondage. Every time we concede, when the forces of darkness advances and we won't stand up to it and we concede, they win more authority. They're winning the authority over the Christian because we're conceding. But if you stand, having done all to stand, stand. Just stand. There's something that's got to get inside of us in America. We're not going to take it anymore. You feel me? But if you'll stand, thing going to change. Verse 37, we're done. Now when they heard this, after all that Peter had said under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what should we do? 
I love that. Then Peter said to them, repent, have a change of heart. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, say that day, the day of Pentecost, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Because one man stood and said, this is not a bunch of drunks. This is that. That was prophesied by the prophet Joel. In the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters, your handmaidens and servants, I'm going to use them. He stood up. And because he would not relent, but he kept preaching the gospel, those that were turning against the move of God repented. And 3,000 were saved. you talking about a revival. Do you think for one moment that 3,000 souls that received Christ in their hearts that day would have gotten saved if Peter would have allowed the naysayers and what they were saying about them being drunk cause him to draw back and hide out? Do you think they would have gotten saved? No. This spirit of selling out and trying to please the world, killing the integrity and the power of the church, and God is tired of it. He's wanting some shepherds with a backbone to tell you what you really need to hear. You're able to take this land. God bless y'all.